According to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. It's great having you with us today. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And we do that by interviewing guests. And today, we're going to be not only interviewing a great guest, we're going to be looking at some incredible uh, footage from a DVD called Evolution, the Grand Experiment. And we're going to be talking today about birds and dinosaurs. Before I introduce the guests, though, I want to introduce the DVD. Life. It is wonderfully beautiful and amazingly complex. But where did life come from? How did we get here? Was the world created by God? Or is life simply a byproduct of a natural process? Be a part of the grand experiment. That's some incredible footage, and we have the executive producer of The Grand Experiment here with us today, Dr. Carl Warner. Dr. Warner, how good to have you here Thank with you, us. Thank you, Don. It's great to be with you. Just so your folks, our folks know, you're a, a graduate of the University of Missouri, and you're a physician by trade. Yes. Emergency room doctor, in fact. Yes, yes. But you have this passion to talk about evolution, and it comes out of your own background as a young man that was challenged to look at the premises. Isn't that true? Yes, I was challenged about my beliefs in evolution and this challenge caused me to go on a grand experiment to go around the world to look at evolution whether it was true or was not true. Now we've been talking about the DVD because that's where we're showing the clips from but I just want our folks to know that uh, there's an incredible book that goes with it. The photography and so forth in this book is absolutely done at uh, the highest possible quality level and then there's also a teacher's manual. And parents, if you're homeschooling or if you have a Christian school, uh, there are just so many places that uh, this could be used and it's tremendous. And then, of course, there's the DVD. Real quick, give us the website where you would go to get that. That's uh, uh, thegrandexperiment.com, thegrandexperiment.com. Grandexperiment.com. Now, 12 years to film this, 100,000 miles, 60,000 digital pictures and 300 rolls of video film. What have you been doing in your spare time? <laughs> we have been working very hard and this project took a world view. You had to basically go to all of the dig sites, interview the scientists in all of the areas. And it was a gargantuan project to put it together, but we were happy once we saw the final product, what the conclusions led us to. Now, today the part of the DVD that we're going to focus on has to do with dinosaurs and birds. Now, when creationists think of dinosaurs and birds, we think of dinosaurs, we think of birds. But when an evolutionist thinks of dinosaurs and birds, it's dinosaurs evolving into birds. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's a difficult thing to explain. The more you know about biology, how that could possibly occur. How could a T-Rex evolve into a hummingbird, something of that concept. It's hard to believe. Now, many people out there in the audience probably incorrectly believe that a dinosaur could make itself change, want to change, and want to, uh, to learn how to fly. But 
those ideas that an animal could volitionally change or could adapt to the environment and then pass those changes to the next generation do not work. The only way a dinosaur could become a bird in the theory of evolution is by a series of accidents in the DNA in the reproductive cells. And those accidents would have to be a string of letters, thousands of letters long that form by accident. And once you understand this, it's harder and harder and harder to even believe the concept of evolution. Adaptation would have been a lot easier to believe in uh, uh, before, we, before we had DNA, wouldn't it? Before we understood DNA. Yeah, Darwin was ignorant of DNA. He didn't know sure. how animals changed, and he had these guesses that they could volitionally change. Right. But once we figured out DNA, and once we realized that DNA's code was fixed, once you're born, it's fixed, you can't change right. it. The theory of evolution ran into huge problems. Charles Darwin suggested that an individual animal could adapt to the environment. But surprisingly, this concept is now considered outdated. For example, a lizard could not grow fur simply because of a sudden cooling of the climate. Even if a skin cell could grow a hair, there's no way for the skin cell to pass this information to the reproductive cells. The reproductive cells, such as the eggs, cannot get signals from the outside environment or signals from the body cells. Because of these difficulties, some biologists have suggested eliminating the concept of direct adaptation altogether. Unfortunately, some naturalists and even university professors still speak in terms of these disproved and outdated mechanisms. The outside environment is changing, therefore the organism has to adjust to those changes if he wants to survive. And even your DNA is getting signals, your, your, your DNA in your egg is getting signals from the outside. And those signals are being translated through stress in your body. This statement is biologically impossible. There is no way to signal the DNA in the reproductive cells as this scientist suggests. Sometimes when one group of scientists disproves a concept, other scientists continue to promote these false ideas for decades, if not centuries. Another scientific theory born around the time of Aristotle was the law of use and disuse, also called the law of acquired characteristics. Scientists thought that animals could change themselves through effort, and these changes would be passed on to the next generation. Darwin used this law to explain evolution. He believed a species could improve itself through effort. That if an animal exercised and developed large muscles, its offspring would ultimately be born with larger muscles. This idea is not true. Even if you exercised your body every day and developed enormous muscles, your child would not be born brawny. Muscle building has no effect on the DNA of the reproductive cells and cannot be passed on to the next generation. Well, actually, of course, Lamarck and Darwin knew nothing about genes or genetics at all. It wasn't invented till long after. They understood heredity, but not genetics. But they didn't understand what, what the mechanisms of. In fact, they were, they were. They went down some, you know, wrong paths on that part. But that's okay. That, that's you know, it was reasonable at the time for them to think that. Darwin also thought that if an animal did not use a body part, such as a leg or an eye, its offspring would eventually be born without these. He envisioned animals shedding body parts this way through the law of disuse. For example, he suggested that the eyes of a mole became covered with fur and smaller because the mole did not use them underground. But this idea is genetically impossible. Using or not using a body part has no effect on the DNA of the reproductive cells and cannot be passed on to the next generation. If you put an eye patch on a baby at birth, and left it there till adulthood, that person's offspring would still be born with normal eyes. Disuse of a body part has no effect on the next generation. In the late 19th century, a scientist with a vivid imagination and a butcher knife put the law of disuse to rest and caused an enormous difficulty for Darwin's theory. A man by the name of August Weissmann devised a, a simple experiment in which he kept cutting off the tails of mice and he did this for 20 odd generations and the mice still had tails. With this simple experiment, 
the law of disuse was invalidated. Scientists continued to explore the law of use and later realized that this concept was also genetically impossible. Any change to body cells has no effect on the DNA in the reproductive cells and therefore cannot be passed on to the next generation. The impact of that uh, experiment and of other uh, skeptical uh, biologists uh, essentially uh, left an explanation for evolution sort of up in the air. And biologists were, although many of them felt that there were changes among organisms, they still felt that there was no adequate explanation to explain these changes. Unfortunately, much of the public believes the law of use and disuse is a valid idea, partly because scientists occasionally describe the mechanism for evolution in these terms. You know, Don, uh, Darwin got these false ideas about use and disuse from Lamarck, a scientist a century earlier, and he just went with it, and he wrote these ideas in The Origin of Species, but now we look at him and it's like, how foolish that a mole not using his eye would make his eye go away. It just doesn't work. But we still hear on your tape scientists, modern scientists today, respected professors saying that somehow the DNA is affected by the stress of wanting it's to change. It's not true. But it simply has no scientific and, credibility. And you read newspaper articles, uh, science magazines, even uh, textbooks, they still go with this incorrect idea of how this evolution could occur. Well. Now, modern scientists believe that dinosaurs evolved into birds, and many say that this is one of the best fossil proofs we have for the theory of evolution. What say you about that? Just imagine if dinosaurs didn't evolve into birds, just for the sake of discussion, and you were trying to prove that they did. You would have a dinosaur, and then you would have a bird. How could you make an intermediate? One way you could do that would be to starting to alter the fossils. You could take the dinosaur and start adding feathers to a dinosaur and putting it up in the museums, which they did. Or you could take a bird and try to make it look like a dinosaur and put scales onto a bird, <laughs> which they did. And I'd like to show you this segment in the show because that's what's going on in the museums right now. Birds are a diverse group of vertebrates. Most are able to defy gravity and fly. Some are able to swim underwater, while others are incapable of flying or swimming. Evolution scientists believe birds evolved from dinosaurs. They refer to the oldest known fossil bird, Archaeopteryx, as a missing link because of its unique mix of both bird and dinosaur-like features. Archaeopteryx is a classical example of a connecting link uh, between two um, uh, high systematic categories, namely the classes of birds and reptiles. Its skeleton is uh, still dinosaur-like, uh, whereas it had uh, already uh, fully developed feathers as the extant birds, and obviously it was capable of uh, powered flight. The existence of such connecting links, that means mm, intermediate stages between large groups of organisms, is a conclusion of Darwin's theory of evolution. And uh, the discovery of the first specimens of Archaeopteryx uh, met the expectations of the Darwinians and had an enormous impact on the uh, scientific community. Opponents of evolution believe Archaeopteryx was simply a bird. Many museum models portray Archaeopteryx with a scaly dinosaur-like head. Dr. Peter Wellenhofer, one of the world's experts on the evolution of birds, believes these museum models are wrong because scales were not found on the fossils. He contends that Archaeopteryx had a feathered head. So we can reconstruct a model of Archaeopteryx based on the dimensions of the skeleton and based on the extent of the wing, of the feathers, of the wing and tail. We don't have a record of the body covering of the head, for example. So reconstructions are, uh, in, in most 
or in large parts are hypothetical and speculative. What is not known is the covering of the head, whether it was scaly. It doesn't mean that, that the lack of feather imprints means that there were no feathers. It's well possible that finer feathers and short and more delicate feathers just were not preserved as fossils, as imprints. They were too soft, too tiny. And how far the feathers uh, reached around the skull, we just don't know. Whether it was scaly like a lizard, we don't know, but I personally, I'm very suspicious that that was true. But as I said, this is all speculation. The good professor talks a lot there about speculation. And uh, we're putting scales where there maybe would have been feathers on the head of the bird. And then we're going to put feathers on the dinosaur to make the connection. And there isn't any proof for that either, right? Oh, there's, there's evidence, but it's shaky evidence. It's so shaky you just want to shake a stick at it. Do you remember the movie Jurassic Park? Yes, sir. That's one of my favorite movies. The kids are being chased around the stainless steel kitchen. And those two dinosaurs, where the one breathes and fogs a window, that was a Velociraptor dinosaur. Now, that's how I always thought of Velociraptor as being a scaly dinosaur. Do you know that scientists have put feathers onto that dinosaur? And you may ask, well, how, what evidence would they have for putting feathers onto that dinosaur? None. None. But we've done it, and we're going to display this at a museum in, uh, in Australia. Let me show you this. Some evolution scientists theorize that feathered dinosaurs existed in the past. In support of this belief, museums have added feathers to many common dinosaur models, such as this Velociraptor, exhibited at the Museum of Victoria in Australia. Opponents of evolution and even some evolution scientists have criticized this practice, since no feathers have been found with any dinosaur fossil. In an open letter to the National Geographic Society, Dr. Sturz Olsen, a Smithsonian Institute evolution scientist, has referred to the practice of adding feathers to dinosaurs as propaganda, hype, wishful thinking, melodramatic, nonsense, spurious, fantasia, and a hoax. He wrote, The idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Truth and careful scientific weighing of evidence have been among the first casualties in their program which is now fast becoming one of the grander scientific hoaxes of our age grand hoax of our age. Um, so we're putting scales on birds, we're putting feathers on dinosaurs, but with virtually no evidence. Is that right? No evidence in both those cases. And actually, it gets worse than this. You could say, how could it get worse than what you just described? Making up evidence, putting feathers on dinosaurs. And I would like to show you a story here. This is a scientist attaching a dinosaur tail to a bird's body and passing it off as a, you know, a single fossil and making a flying dinosaur. This was reported in National Geographic and they said this is one of the best evidences we have for bird evolution, birds evolving from dinosaurs, the flying dinosaur. You got to see this one. This fossil, called Archaeoraptor, was purported to be an unusual missing link which would, once and for all, prove that birds evolved from dinosaurs. It had a long featherless tail, similar to dinosaurs, but it also had feathers and a bird-like body, giving the appearance of two different animals blended together, just as Darwin predicted. As Dr. Rowe carefully scanned the Chinese specimen and watched the cross-sectional images appear on the computer screen, he noticed something was very wrong. Dr. Rowe discovered the 26 fossil bones from five animals, including a dinosaur and a bird, had been fraudulently constructed to make a transitional fossil. And that was the thing that 
caught our attention first. We could find no verifiable fit between the tail, the most spectacular part of this specimen. We could find no verifiable fit between that piece and any of the other parts of the block. And we found other irregularities as well. Even though it seems to fit tightly in here, when you look at it in cross-section, you can see that this piece and this piece have no verifiable association with the pieces around them. The next thing happened were the two shin bones were glued in. And likewise, these have no verifiable associations. The next thing that happened is that the foot was glued on. And I say foot rather than feet because this is a single foot. This is a slab and counter slab that were split and separated and glued in place to make it look as though there were right and left feet there. Uh, it's a clever use of materials. You know, if you're limited, you take a single foot and turn it into two. You know, very, very creative. This schematic diagram shows how many different fossils and rocks were used to create Archaeoraptor. Each color represents a different type of rock and a different type of animal. Dr. Rowe reported his startling discoveries to the National Geographic scientist. Yet soon afterwards, the unexpected happened. National Geographic held a press conference announcing the discovery of Archaeoraptor, failing to disclose the fossil as a fraud. And, uh... We provided the data and our interpretation to the representatives of Geographic and the, uh, the scientists in charge as he walked out of the building, his last comment to me was, well, all of these Chinese things have been fiddled with. But he understood that there were profound questions surrounding this and we'd been brought in as consultants simply to scan the specimen, and uh, which we did. We presented our interpretation original copies of the data to all parties and uh, it was a, a total shock when the news conference came that they were announcing that this was a valid specimen. Three months after the original CAT scan was performed, National Geographic published its story about the discovery of Archaeoraptor. The article claimed that Archaeoraptor was a flying dinosaur, a missing link and the best evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs but failed to reveal the serious discrepancies found by Dr. Rowe. Dr. Winter, I'm having a hard time here. First of all, I'm having a hard time that scientists would deliberately seek to deceive people by making their own fossils where they're literally taking the tail of a dinosaur and putting it on the body of a bird. And then that other scientists would want to publish in National Geographic knowing full well that they are publishing a lie, not the truth. And then third, that National Geographic would whitewash the story with them having all of the evidence from a credible evolutionary scientist that says this is a fake and yet they bury that part of the story. That, uh, you know, it goes past examining evidence. It goes to character, it goes to credibility. Yep, and you look at what we, this is just one story we also didn't mention here about the adding the feathers to the dinosaurs, and you also just didn't mention adding scales to birds. And I have some bad news here. The next video that comes out and the video after this, this is only salvo one. This is a recurrent problem through the theory of evolution, and, and it makes me shudder what I have to share with you in the next video. I'm really excited for your next video to come out, and I hope you'll promise to come back oh, and be sure. on Origins and talk to us about it. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I love to have discussions with people that don't agree with me as long as we're all looking for the truth. Yes. But when I have people who aren't looking for the truth but are only trying to sustain a theory that's no longer sustainable, um, it, it's a very disappointing thing. And uh, I just hope that our viewers, as they think about this, that the, the deception, the deliberate deception being used will put a little uh, a skepticism into their hearts to maybe look at the evidence, the things that they're swallowing whole, and uh, start to chew a little and think about it, and maybe give creation a second view. Mm -hmm. That happened to me. I believed in evolution. People started giving me credible information that disproved the theory, and once I started looking at it, the whole thing fell apart. It was like a house of cards. Yes. Well, you're a, uh, a trophy and a testimony, and we hope that your story and your incredible work will uh, 
urge other scientists and other folks just interested in these uh, in these things to go back and look a second time. Mm -hmm. Seek the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever the truth leads us, that's where we ought to be. You know, if evolution was true, I wouldn't want to believe a fairy tale called creation. No. But but when this is the level of uh, uh, to which people will go to perpetuate a theory, they're only if they had viable evidence they wouldn't be presenting this kind no, of stuff no and i always say look at the fossils folk don't look at the charts look at the fossils many well accepted scientific theories concerning a multitude of subjects have been disproved some thought the earth was flat some thought the sun orbited the earth some thought life came from non-living things through spontaneous generation some thought animals could change themselves through use and disuse and could pass these changes to the next generation. Scientists are just as prone to holding on to old ideas as anyone else. Knowing this list of historical scientific blunders, each perpetuated for more than a thousand years, how many of us have scrutinized today's prevailing theory that humans evolved from a single cell organism that mutated over millions of years? A theory is just that, a theory. We must always bear in mind that any scientific theory may be false and must be continuously subjected to testing. All of Darwin's proposed mechanisms for evolution have proved to be insufficient. Even the new theory, evolution by chance mutations, has its detractors. Darwin predicted his theory of evolution would eventually be proven in the fossil record. More than 200 million fossils have been recovered. Did his prediction come true? Or does the lack of transitional forms between animal groups in the face of an enormous fossil record give you cause to question? Thousands of fossil seals and sea lions have been found, but no ancestors. A thousand bats have been discovered, but there are no ancestors. Despite recovering fossils from a hundred thousand dinosaurs, there are no intermediate forms of these species. Do you agree with modern evolution scientists that evolution is the most reliable scientific theory that best explains the fossils and life itself? What is the truth about evolution? What do you think? Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1009 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1009, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.